So just to recap, because I forgot to start the recording, (laughs) wisdom, (laughs) understanding, silver, gold, and jewels, and all you desire. We've been talking about out of wisdom, um, um, wisdom, uh, riches, and long life, what would be our priority? And we have all seem to agree that um, it's wisdom, long life, and then riches. Mm -hmm. Yes, long life and riches. And now we're looking back over the course of our life to see um, what we may have prioritized differently when we were younger at another stage in our lives. Um, So far, um, many of us have said that maybe when we were younger and foolish, we wanted riches. Mm -hmm. Why does it have to be foolish? Well, I mean, that's what, it doesn't have to be foolish at all, but (laughs) Sevilla is the one who threw that one in there. Uh-huh. I didn't think I was foolish. Yeah, no. <laughs> you did not. You did not. <laughs> it depends on what you do to get the riches. How about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. And sometimes when when um, we're going through our lives and we're suffering loss and we're suffering deep loss or we're afraid of um and what some of our illnesses, we focus on prioritizing on long life. Oh, right. mm-hmm. You know, um, and sometimes it's, it's, we don't really understand and think about prioritizing on wisdom. Mm. Um, I love the fact that everyone says that, you know, I got wise right about where my wisdom tooth came in. <laughs> wisdom teeth came in but it says something i don't it's so funny because i know it has nothing to do with the teeth but it does have something to do with maturity mm-hmm. yeah, I, and I, age yes yeah. as you grow not even numerical age but as you grow older in your spirit mm-hmm. um wisdom becomes sort of much more important doesn't it mm-hmm. yes but i i can you hear me pastor yes oh okay I always felt wisdom comes with experience. Yes. That's how I see that. So the longer you live, the more wiser you become, hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. (laughs) And you know, in the the African tradition, um, when they designate people as elders in the tribe, Mm. it's not because you're older. Mm-hmm. You know, we often think that the elders in our community have earned being an elder. Mm-hmm. In African culture, you don't earn being an elder. You don't earn it just because of your age. You earn it because of the lessons that you've learned that you're willing to share with the community that people can come to you with. You, mm-hmm. you earn it because you've lived a life where even if you've made mistakes, you're living on your learnings mm-hmm. and, you are, and you are revered for living an honorable life. And that is the point through which you go through and you are designated through ritual and ceremony how to become an elder. Hmm. So there are these stages in your life um, where there's a ritual for you to move from one stage to the next. Of course, the first is birth. And then the next is maturity. Mm -hmm. And then the next is when you're married or when you come into adulthood and figure out what your goal is in your life. And then the next is becoming an elder. And then as an elder, when you are assigned an, assigned the term and the ritual comes to you to be elder, when you pass, then you become an ancestor. Mm-hmm. And the most beautiful part about becoming an ancestor is that the ancestors and babies mm-hmm. are the closest because they are the closest to the pure truth. Because there is experience and innocence that is met in in the in the nether sphere between the ancestors and a child and a, and a newborn. Mm-hmm. I like that. Yeah, so I it's a it. it's a beautiful beautiful cycle. Mm-hmm. Um, so this whole thing about learning prioritization and reprioritization is a beautiful cycle that I think that we can sort of all hold on to when we talk about um, this scripture from Proverbs. But in Lent, here's the thing about it. And reprioritizing our lives and focusing, we get to focus on the things that really truly matter. So we begin asking ourselves the question, how do the parts of our lives work together now to glorify God? 
for glorifying our lives and those around us, that's where our healing comes and the healing of the healing of the nation comes. And wisdom, um, you heard in the book of Proverbs where it says that she is more precious. Um, long life is in her right hand. And the in the in the Jewish sensibility and in, in, in the Semitic tribal um, mythologies, wisdom was always a woman. Mm. Mm. Wisdom and creation is a consort with God in creation. God created, um, God had creation in tandem with the conversation with wisdom. So we can never forget her and we can always claim and hold on to her. And remember that fit wisdom, like I'm saying, happy, happy Women's Month is mm -hmm. always a woman. Mm. The strength of wisdom is the strength of women. So this is what I wanted us to understand about what happens when we sit still for a period of 40 days or we, we pray and we return. We can sort of start to recognize and think about, are we still on the track for that reprioritization that we've made since we were younger? And what aspects of prior, how do, what, aspects of priority do we want to prioritize? Uh, what aspects of wisdom do we want to prioritize now? Is it knowing? Is it understanding? Is it discernment? Is it listening? So in different aspects of our, since we all decided that we want to focus on wisdom, what aspects of wisdom now, I charge you over the next few weeks, um, would you like to prioritize in that realm of wisdom, listening, um, discernment? Is it sharing your ministry or sharing your gifts and your sharing your sharing your wisdom with those um, who are younger than you, or sharing your wisdom with those who um, you can see that um, can benefit from your wisdom? Um, and it becomes a joy in your ministry. It becomes a way that um, we begin to heal others. And we begin to heal ourselves because we get to recognize that God has worked with us all of our lives to bring us to this point, not to hold it to ourselves, but to share that wisdom with others. Wisdom may very well now work in tandem with riches, because if you get all these riches and you don't have wisdom, what's going to happen? Lose it. You lose it. What happened? We all know that the statistics of people it. who win the lottery. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Yeah. They use all their money. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you and if you if you have a long life and you have not wisdom. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's just as bad to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now I want to, to shift to our in our remaining time, I want to shift to um this whole idea of what happens when we take this whole notion of reprioritization of wisdom, of understanding of, of riches, silver and gold, and we em and long life and we embrace that. Um, as Martin Luther King said, um, sure, everyone wants a long life. Why would Jesus be any different? Mm. Mm. I was talking with a friend of mine about a, a minister friend of mine about a book that changed my life and a movie that changed my life. And it's called The Last Temptation of Christ. And when I went to see the movie in the 80s, and I came, I came to New York City on my own to see it at the Paris Theater on 56th Street, and they were protesting it. They were protesting the movie. They had nuns and, and conservatives were protesting in the hundreds outside of the movie theater. And I was so moved by the movie that when I came out, I was in tears. And they said, how can you do that? How can you watch that movie? It's blasphemy. I'm like, how could you not? Because you don't know. If you don't see Jesus as a human being, then you don't realize the true depth of the sacrifice that he made for us. Mm -hmm. yes. Because what that movie showed you was that he didn't have to do it, but he did. Mm -hmm. right. And that's without me giving away all of the <laughs> all the plot delineations and so on and so forth. But the book was even more intense with that. Um, because one, I'll just tell you one thing, in the very beginning of the movie, Jesus is making crucifixes. 
Mm. He's making crosses. He's stretching out his arms as a carpenter to make crosses for Rome. Mm. Mm. And he's being chastised by Judas. How can you, how can you work for those Romans like that? Um, and then he has these, these, these powerful, um, it's almost like birds are pecking at his brain and his spirit. It's so painful because it's that divinity that he hasn't accepted as of yet. He hasn't come into the maturity of it yet. And all throughout the movie, he gets more and more and more, comes more and more and more into contact with what God is calling him to do. And he finally on the cross says yes. Mm. So no greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus said, you are my friends. And if you do what I command you, I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have known, made known to you everything that I've heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the Father will give you whatever you may ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. John 15, verses 13 through 17. But it's mind boggling in a way, they say, to think that Jesus wants to, desires to share everything with us. But when it says no greater life, no greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Mm. You are my friends. In that phrase right there, because that's, it's cut off from the sense if you do what I command you, you are my friends, which means that I am going to lay down my life for you because I love you. As a human being, Jesus came into this prioritization of this holiness in this relationship with God as he made his way to the cross. Jesus' friendship with us cost him everything. Mm -hmm. It was that love is what took him to Calvary. It was that agony that he went through. And the friendship isn't just between us and Jesus, it's between all of the community of folks that follow Jesus and call Jesus. It is a community where healing can happen in the most unexpected and amazing ways. That even if we lay down our lives for one another, I was, I'm very, very, very interested and fascinated by the way that George Floyd's sister has been responding to the media as they are choosing the jury in her brother's murder. Mm -hmm. um, she's got this peace about her there is this healing that I have never seen in one of the family members of those who have been taken from us. And you know what she said the other day? When somebody said to her, what is it that you want from this, this trial? She said, justice, mm -hmm. justice, justice, oh, mm -hmm. and justice. Yes, that's all she said. That's all she said. <laughs> that's right. That's all she and, said. And then she said this too. She said, you will always remember his name. Mm. You will always remember his name. Mm -hmm. And I thought about what that meant for Black Lives Matter, what that meant for us in this country, is that this sacrifice that this man made of his life, it is divine in this and, and it, the way that it is being revealed, it could have been swept under the rug, like, it, like the deaths were so many hundreds of years ago. But now it's lifted up to say that it's not right. And we will never forget that name and never forget that incident. I don't know if in that last moment, if he said, it is better to give, lay down my life for my friends, my people. I don't know. But the effect of this scripture and this reprioritization and understanding that there's a greater purpose in what Christ did, I saw that peace that we're talking about, that shalom on her face. 
and in her eyes. And it moved me beyond compare. It's more than just compassion. It's more than just forgiveness. There was a peace that she had um, that is, is sort of a very model of, a, of the peace that you know, Jesus really had to, for three years to be going around talking about, this is what I have to do and what I'm going to have to do and then come to that peace, actually doing it. I pray none of us ever have to get to that point. But to know that, and this is where Andrea and I are reading Harold Thurman with Lab Shul, this is where Thurman comes in, is when you recognize that you are a child of God, then there's nothing to be afraid of. The intimidation and the fear that is used by the oppressor to keep you in your place, the intimidation of violence, that fear can do nothing to you anymore because you realize that you belong to something larger and higher. And that too is a healing peace that we can claim as a people, as the people that follow Christ and that we can tell people who are purported to be Christ followers, this peace is yours if you will but grab it. If you just reprioritize the way Jesus did mm -hmm. and reprioritize for the wisdom of humanity mm -hmm. above your riches, above your wish for a long life, above your wish to be in control mm. and to be on top. If you focus on reprioritizing for wisdom, then you will be one of those who Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, hmm. for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. So congratulations on reprioritizing throughout your lives. Hmm. Wisdom, hmm. long life, life. And, riches. and riches that you now know what to do with. <laughs> yes. well, we pray I that we do. learn how to and continue to. Yes. Yeah. My brothers and sisters, reprioritization. I charge you to go through the rest of this Lenten journey thinking about what aspects of wisdom would you like to reprioritize this season of your life? Is it listening? Is it discernment? Is it quiet listening and preaching and quiet listening and talking to God? Is it thanking God for the wisdom that you have? Is it sharing wisdom through your ministry and knowing that because you have been called to do something, that your actions show your wisdom? Mm. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So hold on to that. It doesn't have to be those things either. You may come up with something completely different about what wisdom what the characteristics of wisdom are. <laughs> but whatever they are and whatever you focus on, may they bring you peace. May they heal. May they heal and make you a healer of the nations. In your spirit. And, and if I could, and if I could just mind. say, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a confidence to admit that you have wisdom. Yes. Um, because sometimes you will say something or feel something or think something or react in a way and somebody says, oh, that's just so wise. And you think, well, I didn't say it for that. I just said it because it came to my mind, you know. Right. Right. But to, but to yeah. know that because we've experienced so many things, um, that, that the least we can do is share that. Yeah. And that becomes our wisdom to share. Mm -hmm. um, I think Jesus was probably born wise. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, and so by the time he got to age 30, you know, I mean, everybody thought he was like 70 because he was so mm -hmm. profound, you know? Um, and I, I, you know, I've had trouble 
sometimes realizing that just what I've experienced is enough. Hmm. I don't call it anything. I don't call it wisdom or anything like that. It's just, just because I've experienced it means that somebody might be able to take that and use it, any little teeny part of it in their own life to either make their life easier or to, to dodge a bullet or whatever, mm -hmm. but to just be confident enough to do it, you know, to just say, use your own life and your own experiences and your own thinking and your own discernment and your own practices of listening to share with somebody that can be be a ministry in just one statement you know um i think i i just i think that's the that's the most challenging of all just believe that who you are and what you are is is enough just yeah. share. right it was very powerful for me the first time a student that I had had in a class or in a tutorial or some section or something or another, came back to Union four years later. And he sought me out and he gave me this huge hug. Mm -hmm. And he said, I gotta tell you, when we were in class mm -hmm. and he had he said, on this date, <laughs> oh my you God. said this <laughs> sentence <laughs> um, and it changed my life. Right. It totally redirected and shifted my life. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what did I say? Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. right. That happened to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That happened to me with Cynthia Folks. Yeah. She said something to me about tithing and about faith. Right. Yeah. Something clicked. Right. And I got it. Right. Yes. yes. Right. Yeah. That happened. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Wisdom, when, when we share wisdom, it becomes like a seed mm -hmm. that if that I hold on to as the faith that it will sprout mm -hmm. when the when the ground is fertile, when yeah. the ground is ready to hold it and to nurture it. Exactly. It may take years. Exactly. You know, I just remember the other day someone was talking about the cicadas coming out in Jersey. <laughs> but think about that. You are underground for 21 years <laughs> until it is time to emerge. It's a long time. But that sometimes is what sharing our wisdom is like. Yeah. yeah. We may not be around to see the benefit of it. Yeah. But know that what you leave yeah. um, will one day blossom in fertile ground. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And I love it when <laughs> young people don't get it until they have their own kids. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Man, I when you told me that when I was a teenager, now I'm saying the same thing you did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. And my mother talks about it all the time when students will come back to her and say, oh, Miss Bradford, mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, it's, I, I don't know what it was, but I'll never forget. Mm. what you said about the whatever it was, you know, and she doesn't even remember saying, it, you know, <laughs> but it was something like you said, Rita, it just clicked. Yes. yes. And, and even mm -hmm. if it didn't click at that moment, it clicked later. You yes. know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's um yeah. It's a powerful thing. It mm -hmm. is very let me share some one more. So choose wisdom wisely, y'all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you see, I have lit, I've actually have three candles that are here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, last week I lit a candle for us to really think about just this light. Mm -hmm. This light, which is not more than darkness, but just as equal, but it speaks to us differently. Mm -hmm. as yes. it flickers. And the wonderful mm -hmm. thing I love about the flame, it's like our wisdom and it's like our faith. It may flicker but it's not going out until it gets blown out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So well. keep your faith. Yes, keep the faith. And, and you know do. that you are loved. Oh, I got faith. Yes. This week, it's, it's really strong this week, so. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Okay, all right. Thanks, you guys. Okay. Right. Okay. I love you all. Okay. Love you too. Love be well. Love all right, y'all. Be wise. Okay, all right. Bye. See you on Sunday.
Okay. <laughs> See you Sunday. Sunday. Okay. All right. Bye. Yes. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Pastor. Bye. You're welcome. <laughs> we'll talk between now and Sunday. You got it. Okay. All righty. Bye. Okay. I don't even know how do I do.